And so everybody, thanks so much for listening to the program. And we really appreciate it. Please like, subscribe, and share if you're listening to us for the first time or even if you're not. Uh, we have a woman that's been on here before, and she's back because we love her, and that's why we bring her back on, uh, Ellen O'Donnell here. Uh, she just wrote the book a little while ago called Bless This Mess. It's about parenting. And, you know, Ellen, we've heard this many times on the news right now. There's so many issues with schools and parenting in general. So that's why I thought it would be great to have you on. Along with her writing this book, also Mo Molly Basquette wrote this uh, along with Ellen. So, but we're going to talk to Ellen about the book and all things school parenting related. So Ellen, first of all, thanks so much for co coming on again. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me back. I like talking with you. All right. So Helen, let's talk about this. Where did you and Reverend Molly meet? Mm. Uh, we met a long time ago when my now 17-year-old was a baby. Um, I guess when we first, first met, I, so I grew up Catholic um, and my faith was a pretty important part of my life growing up. I always went to Catholic school um, and had a, a, a sort of a Catholic wedding. But then after getting married, we sort of stopped going to church. My husband came from a different faith background and we just never found a place kind of um, to both attend. But when my oldest was born, I really wanted that community and that experience for him that I had had growing up. And so I started doing a, a little bit more serious research to try and find um, a church home that would fit us as a family. And I, not really even knowing if such a thing existed, I think, you know, and there was no Google search back then, so I don't know what I did, Bing or something or Yahoo, and looked for a progressive Christian church and uh, found First Church United Church of Christ in Somerville. Um, and that's where Molly was the pastor at the time. And if folks don't know the UCC, it's a Protestant denomination. It's a very old denomination. It's got a lot of ritual and a lot of tradition. Um, but from the start, it's always been sort of out front politically in terms of um, part of the abolitionist movement and had the first African-American pastor, first woman pastor, just always very um, on the forefront of progressive issues in social justice. And uh, we attended a small summer service there and it just clicked. So we never ended up visiting any other churches. And Molly had a two-year-old at the time when my oldest was little and we were looking for daycare and she shared um, that he, her, her oldest was in a small family daycare nearby. And we enrolled Luke and started carpooling together which, uh, as we say, allowed us to see one another's backstage of parenting, all the, the messes and, and mishaps of, that happen early in the morning when you're trying to get everybody out of the house. And we really just became close friends and really relied on one another to talk about our parenting. And we found that the things that I knew from being a child psychologist really resonated with her theology and perspective on Christianity. And we started talking a long time ago about maybe writing a book together, but it, it took a while to actually happen. So those boys we were carpooling to daycare are now uh, 19 and 17, but <laughs> that's how we met. So there's a lot of parenting books out there. I'm not a parent, but I, you know, I've saw them going into bookstores in general. What, you know, makes your book different than all these other parenting books, the thousands of them that are out there? Mm. Um, we hope what makes it different is first that it's really rooted in psychological science of child development, not just of parenting, um, but of what's good for kids in their development, and that it's also really rooted in a progressive theology and Christianity that informs our values as parents. Um, and I think the biggest difference from not all, but many parenting books that are out there is that we try to give helpful, relevant information for parents, but it's not a book that's necessarily a list of, these are the things you should do. These are the strategies to you know, raise XYZ kid. Um, it's really more of a framework that is rooted in that theology and in that developmental science that we hope can kind of guide parents in making the decisions that are right for their individual kids and their individual families. 
um, so that it's not sort of, oh, what do I say in this situation? What do I do in that situation? Um, because no parenting book can give you that kind of exhaustive guide. We wanna give you more of a framework to think about yourself as a parent and about your parenting um, that can hopefully serve your whole family, not just your kids. In, in parenting, we see this, and especially how our culture has really been sexualized. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see some really sexual stuff, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. There's really some really some stuff, unless you put some parental controls on, mm -hmm. these, on these sites. So how do you teach your kids or anybody that's listening teach their kids about, you know, sex ed? Because... In most school districts, there's nothing being talked about. And if we, I personally believe, if we don't teach sex ed, then that's why there's the pregnancy level goes up high because mm -hmm. nobody because, knows right. what the hell they're doing. Right, right. Yep. <laughs> no, and they will, to your point, you know, people will get information where they can find it. Right. So then they're getting their information. You know, we didn't even have the internet to go on and get information. Right. So, and now kids do, and then they're getting misinformation. I mean, we might've gotten misinformation from friends and from peers, um, but it was a whole different level. It's a whole different level now. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the book, we kind of devote a whole chapter to this because it's deserving of a whole chapter. Agreed. And one of the things we say is that it's also deserving of multiple conversations and an ongoing conversation. So it's not sort of having the talk and you know it's over and done with and we've covered it all. Um, that's not really possible, but that it's a series of conversations that start from when kids are very little, beginning with naming all your parts accurately and correctly um, and not using euphemisms because these aren't things to be embarrassed or ashamed of or things that we can't talk about um, and goes all the way up through adolescence. And it fits again with sort of the whole framework of the book, which is that these conversations can come from a place of these are our family values, right? So, and, and those might be different for different families. So you can have these conversations and say, look, you know, it is our family value that you wait to have sex until you're married. Um, and these are the reasons why, and this is how we think about that. Um, but the whole premise of our book is that ultimately it is up to our children to decide for themselves what they value, what they believe, and what they're going to do. We have a lot of influence over that as their parents. And if we use that influence correctly, they're more likely to internalize our values. But it does, you have to accept the possibility that they might not. <laughs> um, and that can be really hard for parents. If you are a progressive, and we do have a lot of progressives listening to this, with all these topics, and I know they need to read the book to get the full synopsis, but kind of <laughs> in a short statement, you know, with all this stuff going on, what would you tell people? Because there's a lot of pressure on parents, and they're also majority of these people are working uh, nine to five, maybe even later or earlier than that. So they could be stressed out. And the kids, maybe they are good kids and maybe <laughs> they're giving them a tough time also. So, you know, what would you tell a parent with all this stuff going on in our country and our culture right now of how to really be a good parent without blowing up? Mm, yeah, I think there's sort of three themes that run through the book, at least from the child psychology side, which was my contribution, right. um, and then dovetail with, with Molly's piece as well. And the first is really getting to know your individual child. So we cover a lot of the research on temperament um, that, that really, you know, what it boils down to is that our kids come into the world not as blank slates at all for us to impose what we think and believe on, they come with their own personalities. Um, and that our job is to, to guide them. Um, Molly kind of came up with this uh, metaphor of, you know, the woodcarver going with the grain of the wood instead of against it. Um, and yeah. that this is sort of the person I've been given. And my job is to sort of guide them into the best version of themselves that they can be. And then the other second theme is one that comes from self-determination theory, which really guided a lot of my research in graduate school and, and even still um, on parenting. And what that says is that what all human beings need, not just kids, is a sense of autonomy, that sense that I'm in control of my own 
choices in my own life um, and a sense of relatedness, connectedness to other people. And when it comes to parenting, the way we can encourage those things in our kids is to give them opportunities to choose. That's the autonomy support. But we also give them structure. And structure is kind of a swaddle. It's a boundary. Um, but really what it is, is information. It's having that open conversation, like I was saying about, hey, here are our values around sex. Here's what we really would hope for and why. Um, and here's what might happen if you choose otherwise. And then being involved and just being present for them um, is sort of the third leg of the parenting stool. Alan, what about the kid that grew up in, you know, the south side of Chicago or, uh, you know, tough areas in Boston or even Providence for that matter, which is out of control? You know, there's the violence, there's the gangs, there's the drugs, mm -hmm. pornography is there. Mm -hmm. the parents on home because they're working all day or and you know, they're trying to, you know, make a good living for themselves, for the kids, or maybe the parents just don't give a damn. What do you do for that kid as a person that works with kids to really help them stay on the right path? Because it's so easy for them in that type of situation to really drift the other way and never look back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, one of the things that is, so the, the, final kind of theme or piece in the book is that um, when we parent our kids out of a place of fear and anxiety, it tends to make us more controlling, right? I mean, anxiety is because we feel out of control. When we're anxious, we do things to try and feel in control again. Um, and that might mean trying to control our kids and their decisions. Um, and the interesting thing about these sort of basic needs that people have is that all of the research su suggests that this is a universal human need, that it doesn't matter what context you are in, this is what all people need, but it might look a little different. Um, so the information and the structure that a parent provides in a higher risk, more challenging setting might look really different from the information that a parent provides in a much more privileged, objectively safer setting. Um, but the way in which it's provided where the child still has choice, they're included in the decisions, um, and they're given that information is what fosters that sense of autonomy and relatedness. And the important thing about involvement is that it doesn't mean being there all the time, physically. What it means is knowing your kid, knowing what they're dealing with, knowing what they're up to, um, and being involved in those conversations, being involved in having those conversations with them. Um, and so that might look a little bit different in a different neighborhood or a different context, but it, um, that's why, again, I think we don't want to get into this, this is what you say, and this is what you do, and this is the strategy you use, because that might not look the same or work the same or be the same, right? And, and we have to acknowledge that, especially for parents who are raising kids in higher risk situations and facing more challenges, it's going to be that much harder for them to manage that anxiety and fear that, that is going to lead them to be more controlling because they have more legitimate things to be anxious and fearful about. But that's what I have always found so helpful about this is it applies with any kid that I'm working with, any family, but it just might look a little different in different settings and for different people. What would you tell somebody that is the helicopter parent? There's a lot of helicopter parents around mm -hmm. and, and they are that soccer mom or soccer dad and they go scream and yell at the referees and they're always at their kid's game. And you got to love them in a way because they really want their kid to be the best they can be. But there's also a lot of pressure that's being really pounded on that kid at early ages and even in high school and college where it could, again, lead down that scary road to death or having some serious mental problems. Yeah, you just gave sort of the classic perfect example in support of self-determination theory. So there's a ton of research that shows that, um, you know, so let me back up for a second. Sometimes those helicopter parents are called over-involved. Yeah. Um, and I sort of take issue with that because that's not involvement. That's control, right? Yeah. That's saying um, you, you sort of need to do these things to earn my love, to earn my attention. Sometimes it comes from what we call ego involvement, where maybe the parent didn't 
have certain experiences or meet certain goals that they had hoped for. And now they're kind of projecting those on to their child. But the bottom line is that they're making playing that sport about something other than enjoyment and even other than being good at it, right? It's not about being better and doing your best and working harder and getting better. It becomes about being the best, about winning the game, making the team, pleasing me. And so it's getting attached to external rewards and external rewards undermine intrinsic motivation. They undermine a child's motivation to do something because they enjoy it or because they feel competent at it or they want to master it. It becomes about earning something outside. And it doesn't have to be a material prize um, that they're working toward earning. And there's a ton of research that shows that when athletes are doing it for some external reward or under that kind of pressure, their performance actually goes down. So sometimes that's sort of the angle to get parents is not only will they potentially hate it, become depressed, quit, they actually will not get better or as good at it as they might otherwise. They're more likely to get injured, all kinds of things. Um, and so that's sort of that helicopter parent. And, and then similarly, we've heard a lot now too about snowplow parents, right? Those mm -hmm. who kind of clear any obstacle and just pave the way and don't sort of let kids make mistakes or face challenges. Um, and, and that's not helpful either because then they're not getting that sense of structure of, oh, if I do this, then that happens. And I feel in control of these outcomes. It's things just happen to me. Maybe it's good things that just happen to me, but I don't really do anything to kind of accomplish that. Um, and so it's sort of taking away their agency in a way that is also not helpful for their mental health. So this is this kind of narcissistic behavior by the parents along with them living through their kids. Like you said, they, they didn't maybe they didn't accomplish winning a medal or getting a scholarship to play basketball or soccer. And they're kind of living through their kids and being a narcissist, like you said, about the love and, and the affection, stuff like that. Sometimes, I think sometimes, but I, I choose to think that most of the time, I think it's really because parents want their kids to be okay, right? They want them to be happy. They want them to be safe. They want them to be successful. They want them to do well. And sometimes the anxiety about what could go wrong, again, makes us really controlling. And so it might be that they have that belief, not just that, oh, I didn't accomplish that thing or do that thing, but maybe if I had, my life would have been easier. And if, if they can accomplish it, then their life will be easier. So I think often the intentions are really good, um, coming from good, loving parents, um, but sort of not realizing that the outcome may not be quite what they're intending. So what do you tell these parents, though, to kind of calm them down? You know, we all want our kids to be the best they can be, but if the kid is going to quit the sport or you know, there's so much pressure on the kid in school that the kids does something dramatic to act out it, their anger or their depression or anxiety. Obviously, that's not going to be good for the kid, the parent or the family in general, as far as the dynamic. Right. Yeah. I mean, when things have already started to go wrong, then it's pretty easy to get buy-in. I think it's harder when things have not yet gone wrong and it seems to be going well to ask parents to change their approach or their philosophy. Um, and so I guess I don't have an easy answer except to say that I think in writing the book, you know, we wrote this kind of parenting book and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that it's really a book more about parents and their own parenting and doing the work themselves than it is about um, kids <laughs> and what to do with your kids. And it is a lot of work you have to do yourself on your own worries and anxieties and a lot of self-reflection that you need to do, I think, to parent in this way. But it's hard. You know, one of the biggest things that comes up a lot when we give talks or interviews about the book is from people from kind of more maybe traditional fundamentalist faith backgrounds yeah. where they say, you know, but, but what then, what if then my child leaves the church or leaves the faith if I parent in this way, right? And we sort of have to say that is a possibility, you know, it could, that definitely could happen. But everything we know from the science says that that is actually less likely to happen if you parent in this way and in some ways more likely to happen if you parent in that controlling way. So going back to the sports, 
your child is just objectively more likely to stick with the sport and continue getting better at it if you parent in this way than they are if you parent in a more controlling way where they're more likely to quit, to hate it, get injured, all of those things. And we actually do have the data to support that. What kind of mistakes do you feel like a lot of parents make when, and we are in the audience question, so with the last two, two to three questions, uh, what what mistakes do you feel like parents make? Be, and now I'll, we're going to kind of go through the ages. Mm. So we got the infant age, then kind of that adolescent age, and then the teenage years. In the infant stage, um, maybe the mistake that parents make the most is just, you know, that's sort of the age and stage that there's the most information out there about you do this, you do that, the strategies, right? Strategies to get them to sleep, strategies to get them to eat, strategies yeah. to get them to not throw a tantrum. Um, and I think the mistake that parents make is sort of not giving enough uh, credit to temperament and to nature and sort of feeling like so much is on them, that they are responsible for so much of shaping this child's behavior. Um, and then that can be at the expense of sort of seeing your child's temperament and figuring out what works for them, which might be different than what works for um, them, even what worked for their sibling, their older sibling, or will work for a younger sibling. Um, so I think that's sort of a, a mistake that parents of young kids make, if we can call it a mistake. They're just too hard on themselves and thinking, if I just do this the right way and employ the right strategies, this will go well. And if it doesn't go well, then therefore it's my fault. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the, you know, gosh, it's hard to say. I mean, this, these are really opinions, but I think for school-aged kids, sometimes we underestimate them. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the concepts we talk about in the book that comes from psychology is this idea of scaffolding, that you always want to be sort of challenging your kids just enough that they're mm -hmm. kind of growing and feeling a, an increased sense of competence or independence without challenging them so much that they're overwhelmed. Um, so it's sort of the difference between that, like coddling and babying and overprotectiveness and sort of pushing them too far too fast. But I think sometimes we underestimate them and we don't kind of give them enough credit or scaffold them enough or give them choices where they can make choices. Um, you know, go back to that sixth grade example of right. Right. My 12 year old could take in that information and he could make that choice for himself. Um, so I think sometimes we underestimate them. And gosh, with teenagers, I mean, in some ways, it's almost like going back to the baby stage. So <laughs> we underestimate their temperament and think we're solely responsible. No, I think the teenage years are probably more where. Are they the hottest? I th oh, that's a good question. I do think there's some truth. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying that little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems, yeah. or bigger problems. I definitely think there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that the biggest mistake parents probably make in the teenage years is falling into that pattern of letting their fear and anxiety dictate their parenting because the stakes do seem so much higher. The problems do seem so much bigger. It does feel like, oh gosh, if you choose wrongly here, it's going to have consequences that are going to impact you for the rest of your life. And there's a lot of pressure on parents as well as on kids, right? Mm -hmm. For success or this or that or the other thing. So I think sometimes the hardest part about being the parent of teenagers, and I'm one now myself, is resisting that pressure you're feeling um, so that you're not pressuring your kids in unhealthy ways. Last two questions. What do you hope people get from the book? Well, the first thing I think we hope they get is that these things are not mutually exclusive. Sort of, you know, being a person of faith and having a family where that's an important part of your family life is not at all mutually exclusive to psychological science or progressive politics. Um, in any way, shape, or form. And yeah, and I think the other piece, you know, we talk also a lot in the book about good enough parenting. <laughs> um, and so I think we hope people take away from it that we can always be working to be better parents um, and doing that work on ourselves. Um, but there's no perfect and that's okay. And we could also do with forgiving ourselves a little bit more. Yeah. So as we end again, for people that are listening, bless this mess. Definitely check out the book. I think it's worth the read. I have it. 
So I'm going to definitely get into it. Um, but again, so Ellen, where can people find the book and learn more about you in general, whether it's on social media, website, whatever it may be? Yep. The um, website for the book is called blessthismessparenting.com. Um, and you can find the book on Amazon or ask your local bookstore. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, and for a little while, we did a little podcast during the pandemic called um, Your Parenting is Showing. That's on Apple Podcasts. And you can find me on Twitter. I think it's Ellen PhD or PhD Ellen. I always forget. Um, and yeah, those are some places to find us. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll put it in the description box. But Ellen O'Donnell, thanks so much for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk with you in general. Thanks for having me back.